morning and welcome to our Sunday meeting. Uh, it's good to see you after most of you, we last saw each other last Sunday and we pray and hope that God was with us the past week. Uh, Psalms uh, 127 verse 1 reads, except the Lord builds the house they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman worketh but in vain. Uh, this psalm assess that unless God builds, unless God watches, our work to honor him will be in vain. No matter how much we create, how carefully we conserve or how hard we work, it is futile and foolish to try to do so independently of God. Amen. Uh, tom tomorrow, our uh, cameo, uh, two o'clock, is led by Major Christine Lam, and the core officers are away from Monday to Wednesday. They will be at the divisional retreat in uh, Barnstable. And next Sunday's meeting is led by Major Dennis. And our next Bible studies, both will be on the 8th of uh, May. And Sunday, 12th May, is the candidate's Sunday. And we'll have a retiring collection after the meeting. And Monday 13, members of the core council uh, will meet at 7.30 in the evening. Uh, uh, Pentecost, it will be on Sunday, 19th of May. And Sunday, 1st June, that's the spring sale from 11 o'clock to 2 p.m. Uh, and all sections are running a table. Uh, we thank God for Major Olives. She is now out of hospital. And we also thank God for Major LC, who is now recovering from a operation. Uh, and Lily Johnson is still in the RIUH. And also legal Samantha has broken a arm. So we need to pray for them. And also Peggy, Peggy lost, uh, her, br Peggy lost her brother about two weeks ago. So let's remember also to pray for God's comfort on Peggy. We pray for her. Uh, yesterday, uh, okay, the temples were supposed to meet today after the meeting, but Due to some uh, concerns, we have yet to put that on hold. Uh, you will be advised of a later date for practice in the future. And uh, yesterday, yesterday, we had, uh, yesterday it was Major Jill, special birthday, special seven birthday. So it was special for that. Uh, we would like to sing that because uh, this birthday was spe was special to Major Jill, so we would like to sing Happy Birthday to her, and also we will be singing, and also we will be singing for Major Elsie, whose, whose birthday I think is on uh, on ma on Monday. Is it tomorrow? Or oh, Linda? Sorry, Linda. Yeah, tomorrow. And also, Barbara was 80, so we got se two celebrations special. Yeah. So we're saying Happy Birthday to yeah. Jill. And Barbara. Yeah. And anyone else? And if we forgot, we apologize. And Linda. And Major Linda tomorrow. Yeah, okay. So we'll sing. I'll, I'll, ask, uh, I'll ask Cliff to help us with. Okay. Let's sing. Happy, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. We thank God for all those years uh, 
there are so many people that were promoted before they go to those years. So we thank God for that. Uh, I'll ask now uh, Beth and company to lead us in the worship. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to worship. We're going to um, start our worship this morning by singing a couple of worship songs together. So if you'd like to stand, we're going to sing a well-known song to start with.
you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free. Whoa, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Father, we thank you that we can make a lot of noise and praise your name. But also, Father, we thank you for the peace and the stillness that comes with your spirit, where we can sing of all that you've done for us. Father, we praise your wonderful name. For you break the power of sin and darkness. Your love is mighty and so much stronger. And Father, we praise your name for that. We celebrate that. But we come humbly before you as well. We put aside the noise and we bring ourselves to you. I invite you to take a seat as we just focus on him right now in the quiet. you want to just kind of hum your own song with the chords in the background sing your song to him speak to him in your own way this is your time this is why you've come and father we come and we meet with you
Father, reign in this place as we learn more about you as we strive to bring our lives in line with you, God. Be in this meeting, we pray. God for that time of worship and, and blessing the Lord through music and through prayer. Thank you, our worship team. Now we're going to listen to the community choir as they bless us with their song. Thank you. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? <coughs> he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? <coughs> he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. We will now sing to you the song, Lord, you know that we love you.
We thank the community choir for that and for Trevor's leadership and Cliff on the piano. And uh, next week will be, we'll have a fortnight practice and once a month we will uh, meet for food and fellowship as well. And we thank Gwen and Trevor for that lovely uh, food that we shared last week. It's lovely to see our young people. Yesterday they went on their trip, didn't they? And you had a good time. I was 15 children went. Unfortunately, Samantha broke her arm in the, the week, and so she wasn't able uh, to come. So we think of Samantha and Jacob today. But I've got a story for the children. No fire this week, fortunately. Four bottles. Uh, in a moment, in fact, would you like to come up now? That saves time. If this four children, would you like to come to the... Because I need four readers, okay? You're all, all going to read something from a bottle. Now, today, there are so many ways of sending messages, aren't there? What are some of the ways, when somebody's not with us, that we can communicate with them? What are some of the ways? Yes. Phone. Phone, yes. Mobile, yes. Anything else? Think of... Expression, yes, right, if you're a long way away, you could, you could go like this, see? expressions, that's a good one. Um, Leanne, can you think of any? A letter, yes, we still send letters, don't we? Some old people like me, we still send letters to people. Theodora. Sorry? You can go visit them, exactly. Get on a bus, get on a train, get on a plane and go and visit them, be a living uh, messages. But uh, some people, when they haven't got a phone and they're in a predicament, there's another way of communicating. And they put a message in a bottle and they throw it in the sea. Has anybody ever done that? No? <laughs> well, there's always a chance to try it. So, and you know, in the sea, it's impossible to predict where the bottle will end up because the, the tides can take it a great distance. And some time ago, an experiment was carried out to track two bottles dropped into the sea from Brazil. One bottle drifted for 30 days before it reached a beach in Africa. The other floated for 190 days, reaching the country of Nicaragua. Nic I can't say that. Nic Nica you have to be careful how you say that. Nica Ag Can somebody say it for me? <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, the country beginning with N in South America. Now, a bottle is, you might think it's fragile, but in the sea, it's one of the most seaworthy objects because glass can last a long time. In 1954, 18 bottles were salvaged from a ship that had sunk 250 years before and the liquid inside was unrecognizable, but the bottles were as good as new. I suppose they were covered by the mud and the, the sand, and they were great. Now, these are four actual messages were, that were found by strangers. So I'll give the first one, and I'll tell you the story behind it. Would you like to take the message out and read it to us? It's only a few words. Obviously, they would have put their address. I haven't put the address on as well. But I've just put the message. Can you read the, come to the mic and read the words. Yeah. Hello, please write to me. That's it, that was it, with the, with the address. And that was written by a four-year-old girl who threw it into the sea from Morecambe Bay as part of a nursery school project titled Beside the Sea. And do you know, can you guess where that bottle eventually ended up? Have a guess. Yes. Not Nicaragua. <laughs> yes, Philip. Yes, Australia. That's incredible, isn't it? Australia, well done, well guessed. If I had some sweets, I'd give you one as a prize, but I haven't. And so it ended up in Australia. The second bottle, I think this is the one, dropped by a Swedish sailor overboard called Abe Viking, that was his real name, Abe Viking, and it was picked up by a Sicilian fisherman. Would you like to read the message? If anyone finds this, please write. 
If anyone finds this, please write. Well, the Sicilian fisherman, that's at the bottom of Italy. I should have put my globe on, sorry. I'm not ready. Yeah. Just in case you don't know where that is. Here's England, and there's Italy, right at the bottom there. So, and he gave it to his daughter, Paolina. This is true, this. You may not think so, but it is. He gave it to his daughter, who wrote back to the Swedish fisherman. The couple met and subsequently got married. There we are. So if you want a husband or wife, throw a bottle <laughs> into the sea. <laughs> bottle three. Would you like to read another true story? Would you like to read that, take that out? Chippo, well done. Come to the mic. Help, please help us. Help, please help us. And it was written by a group of 88 refugees abandoned in the seas off the coast of Ecuador, South America. The boat had started to take in water. Miraculous, mir I can't say that either. Miraculously, the boat was found and they were all saved. Hallelujah, because of a bottle. Finally, number four, there we are, pull out the message, go to the mic. God loves you very much. God loves you very much. And it was sent by a missionary organization called Bread on the Water. I wonder how the person responded who read it. Perhaps he already knew God, perhaps he didn't, but he read the message. And inside it, inside the bottle folded up was also a New Testament. So he had God's word to read. I wonder, children, what would you write if you were to send a message in a bottle into the sea? What would you write? Can you think of anything you might write? It's a bit, I've put you on the spot, haven't I? It's difficult, isn't it? But you know, in a sense, we're like messages, aren't we? Each of us, we're like messages in a bottle in life. And as you grow, go into life, you're gonna go into the world. You may travel, you may go to Africa, you may go to India, you may go to Europe, to the Antarctic, I don't know where you'll go. And you're God's message, aren't you? And hopefully God will speak through you to somebody else to share the love of Jesus. Thank you for reading those out for me. And now we're going to take up the offering. Thank you very much. Thank you for your giving. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do indeed count our blessings every day. And we thank you for the major blessing that you gave to each and every one of us. We thank you that we are able to join together here and we place these offerings on your altar table this morning. Heavenly Father, bless the monies that we have given. May it be multiplied so that we can spread your word throughout this city and throughout the world. Amen. Um, we're about to do the gift aid return for um, the tax year 23-24. If you have um, moved or if you don't gift aid and would like to, if you could please see me, because if you've moved or if your tax status has changed, um, please come and see me as soon as possible so that we can make sure we have an accurate claim. Thank you very much. Now the band is gonna bring us their message. Thank you, band. And we're going to bring you a piece um, by Marion Parker called Oh Give Thanks.
Thank you. That was short and sweet, but lovely, wasn't it? Thank you, Bandmaster. Thank you, Band, for that lovely piece. Bright and cheerful. Now we're going to sing together song 907 as the children go out to kids' church. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came in to my heart. Song 907, we'll sing the first uh, two verses. And then there's opportunity if anybody would like to give a word of testimony, a word of witness, recent something that's happened to you recently, a blessing, and you want to share it with us and to bless God, then please be ready after the second verse. Let's sing it together. to it. I realize it's difficult if you're traveling a long way. But we were praying and as we were praying, Ewan and Philip and Caleb were playing their instruments downstairs and they were playing what a friend we have in Jesus. And I thought how it, it spoke about that, the line of prayer. All our, uh, What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh. Bear. Privilege. That's the word. As they were playing it, it came to me those, that line. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. It was like prayer with mu musical accompaniment, you know. It was great. And uh, it's wonderful, isn't it, that we can pray and God hears and God intercedes for us all. Anyone else with a word of testimony? I had the um, opportunity to go to a crazy meeting last night and I was over at St. Matthew's in Whitfield. And one of the testimonies that was given now has actually hit me quite a bit. Um, is that one of the guys had actually spoken to another guy that was living on the streets and he'd bumped into this guy in Anster and didn't think much of it, didn't even realise and this guy had just had this instant calling to 
just bow and pray in the middle, just in front entrance of Asda. Later on that day, the scene as that guy did that, another guy had come in and he'd heard from Jesus that he had to find the guy that was praying in the front entrance of Asda. Um, and they stood there and they prayed together. And the last thing that happened to that was that that gentleman actually gave his life over to Jesus later on that evening. It's good sometimes to be visual, isn't it? And to be bold in our prayers. Thank you, Sue. Let's sing uh, verses three and four. And if there's anybody else who'd like to give a word, you're welcome at the end of verse four. I'm possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure together. I'm possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure since Jesus came into my heart. And the dark as a dark of my heart made obscure since Jesus came into my heart. the Bible reading taken from Hebrews 10 19 to 25 thank you good morning good morning this morning I'll be reading Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 to 25 therefore brothers since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to hope we profess, for he whole, whole promise has prayed for faithful and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching amen
Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. I'm sure many of you here will have life assurance. You pay monthly contributions over your lifetime so that when God calls, your ho calls you home, your family will be provided for and you will have enough to pay the funeral. It's a good provision, especially if you have a young family, knowing that they will be covered in the event of an accident. I don't know, I've never known why property cover is called insurance, but life cover is called assurance. But both words come from the same root Latin word, meaning safe and secure. It's a positive declaration that something is sure and certain. But it's also a word which we use in our doctrine book, which applies to our hope and trust in Jesus. Now, legal insurance is a necessary protection. If you're, if you're driving or if you've got a house, you need to have it. We were once called out 40 years ago when I was first commissioned to Hoxton. Whenever there was a big fire or disaster, our, our vehicle was called out, our tea vehicle, and we would give refreshments to the police and the emergency workers. And we went to one cold, wet evening to Middlesex Street, Bishopsgate, which is commonly called Petticoat Lane because of the market there on a Sunday, and a shop was fully ablaze. The whole thing was on fire. And we gave drinks out to the firemen, and the owner was there, devastated. It later emerged that the owner had failed to insure his property. There would be no financial cover to pay the colossal damage, and I imagine he was ruined and bankrupt. When you get saved, you place your trust in the finished work of Jesus, and you enthusiastically, especially if you're a young person, you begin to follow Jesus and try by God's grace to be obedient to his teachings, to obey his will. But as time goes on and you meet temptation and doubts, you begin to waver and you ask yourself, am I really saved? Am I sure about my walk with God? And at that time you need reassurance and help. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30, the Apostle Paul declares, the time of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man who he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all men by raising him from the dead. How then can you know that you are secure and assured in Christ? Firstly, what is assurance? Or rather, who is the assurance we receive when we fully trust Christ? We've all heard many times or read the story of the young John Wesley, who later formed what would become the Methodist Church after he died, and he'd gone out as a keen missionary to preach the gospel to the Native Americans, but he returned a failure because he realized he couldn't point anybody to the master because he did not know the master himself. Despite all his education, despite his wonderful Christian heritage, he did not know Jesus fully. He did not have the assurance of his faith. And so Wesley went into Aldergate Church, London, in the city, and he heard whoever it was, we thank God for that person, reading a commentary on Romans. And as that preacher, that priest, read that Bible passage, Wesley felt his heart strangely warmed. And from that moment, Wesley felt assured in his faith. He began to trust God, and he went forward preaching the gospel, all over the world, especially in Bristol and to the miners, where thousands of miners were converted in the Kingswood area and found Jesus. Assurance is surely the Holy Spirit confirming our faith in Christ, reassuring us he is with us, that no matter what happens, 
all will be well. And he gives us the confidence to go on. Assurance is like a qualified driver who takes over the control of a vehicle from someone who is a learner panicking at the wheel because he doesn't know how to drive or where to go. It's interesting in, in Bath, you see many uh, parents, young parents and not so young parents, pushing their toddlers, their babies in the, in the pram. I used to do it in Germany. My son Isaac would get on the back in his little chair and I would cycle along the cobbles. I always remember seeing a nun cycling and she got stuck in the, um, in the, the, the ridge of the tram and she fell over, but I didn't laugh. But, uh, <laughs> but you see these parents who are very brave with these huge bikes and they have a great big barge at the front, some of them, and the little child is in the front. And I always think what would happen if the, if the, pram, if the pedal bike crashed because the child is right in the, the front. But imagine if, imagine if the parent said to the little child, their son or daughter, well, I think I'll have a rest today. I'll get into the front bit and you pedal. Of course they couldn't, they couldn't reach the pedals. They wouldn't have the strength, would they? They wouldn't have the strength to, to pedal along. In fact, on Friday I saw a man going up a hill, pedaling with his wife in the front. And I thought, he's a strong man, but he got there. He must have been proving that he loved his wife. Well, assurance is the Holy Spirit taking control from the immature childlike believer because the Holy Spirit knows we have to reach our destination and journey forward. The Bible makes this clear in 1 John 4, 13. It confirms this when it says, we know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. Thank God for the Holy Spirit that when Jesus returned to heaven, he didn't leave us alone. He gave us the counselor. He gave us the guide. He gave us our blessed friend, the Holy Spirit. Secondly, assurance is looking from self to Jesus. In Hebrews is a lovely short verse which simply says in the authorized, looking unto Jesus. Satan constantly wishes us to take our eyes off Christ and to look at our failures, to look at our weaknesses. And we all have it, don't we? The devil whispering on our shoulder. Look at, look at your past. Look at the things you did. Your sins are too great for pardon. You've got no faith. You never really repented enough. You don't have the joy of being a real Christian. And the devil whispers that in our ears. And on he goes. And we think we shall never find comfort or release. We will never find assurance. But the Holy Spirit comes alongside us and says, yes, you are nothing, but in Christ you are all in all. In Christ's love you are precious. In Christ's love you are the apple of his eye. In Christ's love you are altogether lovely. Christ's grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Last week my wife Denise spoke of how as a child, she was not encouraged by her mother growing up and was told that she would be nothing. She would be nothing. But my wife, Denise, proved her mother wrong and has been a wonderful officer, <coughs> wife and mother, and achieved much for God. And you know, the Salvation Army, its officers and soldiers, are a shining light to the world how God can take ordinary working-class people like me and Denise, and make them something. And we think of all the famous Salvation Army officers. I think of Joe Burleson, who came from a poor life and yet was a wonderful trophy of grace and a wonderful example uh, to people on the soup run and, and in Hoxton. And he was a great man of God. Think of the musicians, ordinary working class people who God has taken and has used them for the glory of God. Thirdly, you have assurance when you realize through faith you are adopted into God's family. Galatians 4, 6 says, because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit calls Abba Father. 
you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you an heir. I imagine, perhaps some of you here are adopted, I don't know, but if you're adopted, you must have many conflicting emotions. You must sometimes think, who am I, who am I really? Especially if you don't know where you've come from. We think of foundlings, don't we? Babies that have been left on the street, left in cupboards and toilets and all sorts of places, and they've been found, thank God, by somebody, and they've survived. And they don't know where they've come from. Of course, with DNA, they can begin now, nowadays to find out things about people's past. But, you know, I've met some adoptees who've such, had such a wonderful upbringing, they've never wanted to search for their real parents, including our over 60s secretary, Pat at Bristol Kingswood, who was devoted to her adopted mother. Her adopted mother went into hospital to have a baby. The baby died. Another baby was there and was left. And because she said, I'm not leaving this hospital until I have a baby. And they gave her that baby. And she brought and raised Pat, and Pat loved her mother. And she said, I don't want to find out who my real mother was because I've had the perfect mother. Do you ever think where you might have been if you'd not found Christ and Christ found you? Where would you be if you didn't know Jesus? Would you even be alive? Perhaps you'd have got into the wrong company. The gospel definitely lifts you, not only in your heart, but in your education, your morals, your outlook. For many, it lengthens your life because you avoid the evils that so many people in this world encounter and give into. It brings you into the family of God. It brings you into a wonderful means of serving Jesus and caring for others. You inherit brothers and sisters in Jesus. Your outlook is no longer provincial and narrow and blinkered, but you look out onto the world as God's mission field. Finally, in Ephesians 1:13. 14, Paul uses two more symbols representing God's assurance in our hearts. And Paul says, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. You will have heard of the expression signed, sealed, and delivered, meaning something has been completed in every stage. And we know there was a time until comparatively recently, and perhaps it still happens for important documents, when documents were authenticated by the seal, and the lawyer would light the candle, the special uh, red candle wax, and let it drip onto the paper, and then with a seal or signet ring, it would be impressed onto the melted wax, meaning it was complete, it would not be tampered with. The Holy Spirit is God's seal upon our lives, validating that we belong to Jesus. We belong to Jesus. We belong to his kingdom. We are assured of his ownership and authority. God says, you are mine. And we say, I am yours. Likewise, God has assured us of his presence and care by giving us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee, as a down payment of full payment to come when we reach heaven and glory. In 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. We've got something wonderful to look forward to. We can't even begin to imagine or what it's going to be like. And Paul was speaking to businessmen in Ephesus, which was a a business city. And he was trying to use language they would understand to bring them assurance, full assurance of faith. Because we all suffer with guilt, don't we, from the past. We've all done things which are wrong. But you know, it's under the blood. It is under the blood. It is forgiven and it is forgotten. And there's a fantastic verse in the Old Testament, in Micah 7, 18, 19. It says this, Who is a God like you? Who pardons sin 
and forgives the transgressions of the remnant of his inheritance. You, God, do not stay angry forever, but you delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot. You will hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Gone, 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 gone. All my sins are gone. Buried in the deepest sea, that is good enough for me. And God puts up a sign saying, no fishing, no fishing. It's gone and finished. Are you assured in your faith? Because God wants you to have confirmation in Christ. He wants you to live by faith, not by feelings. And to rest assured that the promises of God are sure. For feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. Our warrant is the word of God. Naught else is worth believing. Amen. We're going to sing that chorus but first we're going to pray together let us pray father god we thank you because you assure us through your precious holy spirit that our sins are forgiven that once we've repented they've gone they're under the blood and we don't have to keep digging them up and bringing them back even if the devil does even if our enemies do because we are cleansed through your precious blood Lord, we thank you for everyone here today, and we pray that each of us may be assured of our place in your kingdom, assured as of our place in your family. We thank you, Lord, that when you did your work on the cross, it was a complete work. We didn't have to add to it by works. We didn't have to have the right feeling, because we're, we're humans, Lord. You know what we're like. We're emotional. Some days we're high and some days we're low, but we're not trusting in how we feel. We're trusting in the word of God, in the finished work of Christ. So help us to believe that and to know that and not to doubt, because we pray in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now we're going to sing that chorus, an old chorus. Gone, 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 all my sins are gone. Now my soul is free, and in my heart a song buried in the deepest sea. That is good enough for me. I shall live eternally. Praise God, my sins are gone. We haven't got the music, but some, can you, do you know it at all, Cliff, or not? Not really, but give us a note and we'll try and hit this. Okay. That's the tune. Gone, 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 all my sins are gone, and my soul is free and in my heart. Song 805. I am so glad that I am in heaven. Song 805, and we stand to sing.
God's blessings surround you each day.